just just a moment. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Susan Weisowitz, and I want to welcome everyone to the Governor's Council on Women and Girls panel discussion on uh, one of our favorite topics, computer science education. Today's panel is going to explore uh, the different ways that our teachers are bringing computer science into their school curriculums. Some of you may know I'm a big champion of STEM curriculum, uh, and I want all of our students to study this important topic. Uh, and in Connecticut, 94% of our students attend a school that offers a computer science course or one or more, but only 13% of our students are enrolled in a foundational computer science uh, class. Students who learn computer science in high school are six times more likely to major in the field and women are 10 times more likely, which is why we're having this conversation with the Council on Women and Girls. So it's really, really important that we increase the number of students that are engaged in computer science because exposure to STEM early on has shown an increase in matriculation in college as well. But regardless of whether students end up staying within the STEM field, students do get really great skills that grow and evolve over time, which make them very successful in whatever career path they choose because computing is something that is used all around us in every industry you can imagine, including government and politics. So in order for us to get there, uh, we rely very heavily on our teachers to inspire our students, but also to teach it in a way that's fun and captivating and maintains continuity amongst other grade levels. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from our wonderful group of panelists. Um, there are teachers who are going to share the many ways that they are bringing computer science into the classroom. So we're going to go ahead and jump right in. And I want to thank each of our distinguished panelists for joining us today. So we're going to start with a question for everyone. Can you each um, respectively share your path into computer science teaching. So we're gonna start with our panel members. Um, so uh, I'm gonna ask uh, Madam General Counsel, do you wanna go ahead and call on them? Sure, we'll start off with Nicole. Hi guys. Um, I got into computer science education in kind of a roundabout way. Um, so my master's is in special education and I was lucky enough to be placed in a district that had a um, enrichment and digital literacy position open. Um, and I just really jumped at that opportunity and then kind of ran with it. And now it's become something that uh, has become pretty central in my life. So um, I guess a little bit of luck, but also um, a lot of hard work in the past year, definitely, so. Okay, now we'll start with Kristen. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Kristen Viola here from Newtown High School. And uh, my path was kind of unique. I started teaching in Coventry um, High School and I was an English teacher. And I was finding, trying to find a way to engage students in the literature. And so I just randomly brought them to the computer lab one day and had them start writing their own books. And I really saw how computer science and just using technology at that level could really inspire and engage students into literature. And so it also inspired me to see, gee, what can I do more? And so having not really touched a computer much in college, believe it or not, uh, two years later, I found myself um, taking the job at Newtown um, as a 
part greenhouse and part computer applications and slowly just morphing that program into computer science as I see a greater need for the study of actual programming, not just the applications. So it's been a fun journey. Thank you. Okay, Jackie. Hi, uh, my name is Jackie Coricelli. I am a teacher at Conard High School and I work at West Hartford Public Schools. Um, I, I have a four step <laughs> in my journey that I'd like to go through. First, I'd say is my aunt giving me a Commodore 64 computer when I was 10 or 11. Um, I used Ranger Rick to code and to me it was art. I didn't realize that was computer science and I really, really liked art. Um, and I really think that that was uh, the beginning of how I eventually would want to teach computer science as sort of a discovery. Then I graduated from UConn. I never took a course in computer science again because I didn't know what it was and I think I was afraid of it. Um, Raytheon hired me as a software engineer with no experience in computer science, but it was the year 2000 and that sort of thing happened all the time. So I worked at Raytheon for three years as a software engineer using C++ and then MATLAB. And in so doing, I really did learn uh, sort of step three, that project-based instruction, that just-in-time training, and what what it what a special thing it is when students have a need to solve a problem or have a new understanding, and you can create that need in a classroom and then meet it in the same way that the engineers at Raytheon did for me. I really wanted to pay that forward and do it for students. And then finally, teaching. I started as a math teacher in 2003 at East Windsor. My first academic love was mathematics. To me, it was like a storybook that never ended. Um, and I kind of continued on to incorporate more and more of the programming stuff that I had done at Raytheon, and then eventually went on to teach AP Computer Science A, um, using some of the stuff from Raytheon again, AP Computer Science Principles, exploring computer science. We've created a new course called Crypt and Cyber, Cryptography and Cybersecurity, and we just continue to offer new courses as a form of professional development for, for myself and for teachers. Um, so it's just, it's been an ongoing fun journey. I agree with what everybody said, and um, thank you. All right, now I have Stacy. Hi, yes, um, I also did not have a direct path to computer science. Um, I actually started out as a biology major going to Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, and I decided then at that point that I was really more interested in education. So I transferred and still I started teaching right out of college math and science and I loved it. And it wasn't until I got into Connecticut where all of a sudden computer science was up to the forefront, so yay, Connecticut. I got a job working for the Connecticut Center for Advanced Technology, where I was basically doing student programming and teacher professional development, focusing on manufacturing and green technology. And as we all know, that computer science plays a large role in getting those machines to even work, and that programming played a large part. I then took a job at ESCON, where I exposed students to robotics and programming and how they actually work together. And I started developing after school programs and working with teachers in and out of school to make sure that they have exactly what we need. Now I'm here in Windsor as a STEM coach and my job really is to make sure that the science and math teachers are not only making sure that our students are getting what they need in computer science, but also in the sciences and the math and understand how they work together and that we need well-rounded students that can basically move forward in the 21st century and give us give us everything we need. Thank you. That's all the panelists, LG. Wonderful. Okay. So we are going to turn to Jackie. Uh, you have a very, ex a very um, exhaustive background with many different facets and you wear a lot of different hats. Can you uh, speak a little bit about the role that you play in the West Hartford Public Schools as a computer science curriculum specialist? Yes, I'd be honored to. I First, I want to say that it's really neat that West Hartford has created this position. So I teach two courses in computer science now, and then the rest of the time I uh, meet with different uh, 
teammates to be able to think about how to move computer science forward district wide. Um, some of the work that we've done in, in terms of this role is um, this, well, this past year, I'm super proud, we had a, a team of library media specialists who were excited about experimenting with integrating computer science. Uh, sorry, I should rewind. West Hartford is really about computer science integration. So not about necessarily having a teacher come in and um, help with another teacher to be able to deliver, but instead uh, slowly building the ability for teachers to integrate in an authentic way in their classrooms. And so a team of library media specialists approached me, for example, this past year uh, to be able to integrate library media specialist standards and computer science standards together. And I think sometimes we throw around vocabulary like CS integration. I wanna make, make sure that that's it's clear what I'm meaning when I say that. CS integration, in my opinion, done well, should be the better way to teach whatever standard um, you're trying to teach for the course that you're trying to teach. So for example, for library media specialists, if you teach a, to a CS standard and a library media specialist standard done right, you should never want to do it a different way. <laughs> it, should be, it should be the right solution to help, to help students to move forward. And that's what we were looking for. We were looking for three specific lessons uh, this past year that uh, would allow our students in grades three through five to experience library media specialist standards and CS standards at the same way. Uh, one specific example I could give is, and it's this is a result of the library media specialist team being very creative. They um, came up with an idea of, you know, when you're in grades three through five, finding your just right book is a really important problem for students to solve. Well, finding your just right book is an algorithm, right? So writing down that algorithm, what's your unique algorithm for finding your just right book? Putting that together on a bookmark and then coming up with a team algorithm for finding our just right book. That's a beautiful example of a library media specialist standard that is also CS standard and using the words algorithm, combining with sequence and selection and iteration and practicing those words in that context is okay. So that's the library media specialist. We also have a team of high school computer science ambassadors where our high school students want to be leaders in this computer science space. They wanna be advocates for equity in the classroom. They know it's not fair or right that the um, population of students that continues to study computer science is not as diverse. They know we won't solve as many problems as we could with the uh, representation of people in the classroom and they wanna be part of the solution. And so we've mobilized our high school computer science ambassadors and this position has given me the time to be able to work with them for different initiatives throughout the district to be able to move, move us forward. Um, in addition, uh, we are super excited. West Hartford is allowing me to take a leadership role in planning the CSTA New England Conference that will be hosted at UConn. And so um, we, I'd like to formally welcome everybody in attendance. We really hope you'll take advantage and uh, of the fact that it's gonna be here at UConn this year. Um, in addition, we have uh, done work with helping teachers to be able to pass their praxis. So all of that, all of that is a direct result of West Hartford being able to create this position so that we can sort of um, str strategically use me <laughs> and strategically work together to be able to move computer science forward. Um, none of it would be possible without teamwork though. There's just, it's beautiful inspiration from lots of people in the school system who are, who are excited about moving computer science forward in our district. And um, I'm just, I'm just sort of providing voice and, and, um, hopefully some, some cool ideas along the way as well. And I also wanted to say, um, Lieutenant Governor, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say something to you, but I really of remember, yeah. <laughs> okay. I, I don't know if you remember um, me, I, you were a presenter at our National Honor Society so long ago when I was working at East Windsor High School. So I'd like to formally say that the idea of you helping to move women forward in our state is not a new idea. Even then, I remember you talking about that. And I think that was probably 2005 or 2006, something like that. So thank you so much for doing this. And um, I, I'm thinking, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll, t I'll tell you this, uh, <laughs> when we have achieved true parity and equity for uh, women, I will stop talking about it, but oh, that's um, it. Yeah. I think, I, I think uh, alas, we, we will all have to keep talking about it. 
uh, for the foreseeable future. So thank you so much for that. Uh, we're going to go to Kristen, uh, who's been a champion for computer science for a long time and really played an instrumental role in getting students in Newtown uh, engaged with a computer science curriculum. You have one of the three computer science honor societies in the state uh, and have hosted computer science nights for students. Very cool. Can you talk about some of the ways that you have gotten students fired up about computer science and why you think you've become so successful in doing that in Newtown? Well, thank you for acknowledging our honor society. Of course, you know, that's a, you know, all off to the kids there. Um, but first, uh, I'm in a very fortunate district in that I get a lot of support from my administration. So we are able to have a lot of freedom to try new ideas and they don't mind supporting new ideas as long as it's what's best for kids. And so when I wanted to try and encourage more students taking computer science, um, obviously I could talk to my coworkers and I would talk a lot to uh, different teachers and ask for recommendations for students, you know, and it was a real grassroots effort to begin with. Um, and honestly, it was finding the data, finding um, students that might show an interest asking the school counselors for uh, women who and girls who did well on PSATs or SATs and actually writing personal letters of invitation to the family and to the girls and saying that they've been identified as someone who might be successful in computer science and um, having one-on-one -on -one meetings with these families. So a lot of time was spent in this more of a grassroots approach to try and build awareness. Um, and that reaches down to the eighth grade as well, reaching to the computer integration teacher and asking for a list of students that I could personally invite to encourage take computer science courses. And if not, also just let them know of the different computer science clubs that we have or the competition teams that we offer here at the high school. Um, so there was a lot of this very individual approach on my behalf. Um, I also try and make sure that the Newtown B is well aware of all these different events that we have because I do feel like um, we do so much as teachers that we don't always let the public know. And I think that just letting <clears throat> the local newspaper be able to make an announcement or cover something that it lets the parents see what's going on and the opportunities that are available in the school. Because I do feel that sometimes we have these great options, these great programs, but no one knows about it. And it's sometimes the best kept secret. And so getting the word out is very, very important. So um, we've also been able to do that a lot also with the Lieutenant Governor's Computing Challenge. You know, I had to bring that up at least once. And so uh, thank you very much for the ongoing support and bringing that um, competition to the, to the state. And so having students participate in that and be acknowledged at the year end event. Again, all of this is just building um, confidence for different people, whether it be uh, minorities or girls or not minorities or girls. And each one of those students reaches out to another friend and says, hey, look what I did, look what I built. And it's a lot of word of mouth, you know, but it's gotta start somewhere, you know, and it has to be, maybe it has to be a noisy teacher who writes a million letters every spring to invite you to take a computer science class. Or maybe it's another student allowing them to bring their friend to class and being able to sit with them and build something with them and just creating an environment where people are welcomed. And so I think that's what really has been most successful. You've also mentioned our CS nights that we've held with the Honor Society. And as Jackie mentioned, we also try and do um, some outreach programs, and these are primarily targeted at the um, middle school and the intermediate schools. And so we offer these nights. So again, siblings can come, they can bring um, their friends and the parents participate as well. And so even if they're not getting it in the classroom or at home, they have a fun night at the school and they really like seeing the high schoolers running a program and working with the students. And I'm sure Jackie, you see that also with your high school ambassadors. So it's really magic when you start having other kids supporting other kids. And so I think that is really empowering and one of the reasons why we're successful. 
Well, it starts with an engaging teacher and uh, getting some students involved who in turn get others and mm -hmm. it's networking, right? And when kids are having fun and enjoying what they're learning, then um, it gets uh, addictive in a very good way and um, the word gets out and people want to be part of it. So thank you for that. So let's talk about Alliance School Districts. Uh, they are school districts that are scoring at the lowest accountability index measures. Um, so I wanna ask Stacy, as a teacher in an Alliance District, how have you approved teaching uh, STEM or computer science to your students? How have you gotten them interested and are there specific challenges that stand out for Alliance districts that they have to overcome? Uh, yes, um, as an Alliance district, as all districts, we have our challenges. And again, a lot of that falls into the category of us not meeting the needs of all of our students. So as an elementary school in particular, one of the things that we really focus on is math and reading. Um, and everything else kind of takes a back burner to that. But in Windsor, we prioritize more than that. So at the elementary school level, we also have media specialists that part of what they do is introduce students to coding. They introduce students to programming and they introduce students to actual robotics. So it's a three part and they do different things at different grades. Things like sketch, actual coding, as well as programming is how we start. Then we can look at at the middle school level where they are actual robotic programs and competitions that we um, participate in. And at the high school level, we also offer those computer science programs. My son is actually graduate from Windsor High School and he took an AP computer science class and now is an AP computer science major at RPI. So the fact is it was through that exposure um, that he realized that that was something that he was interested in doing. And yes, we definitely have challenges. And part of the challenging is realizing that it's important that we expose our students to more than just the reading and the math, that we are making sure that STEM is embedded in everything that they do, because we are not gonna get our students to go into careers. We are not gonna get our females interested unless we expose them to those things. So as Alliance Districts, we have to decide that yes, reading and math is important, but STEM is important too. And if we prioritize that, our students will be well-rounded and they will go into those careers. And that's what we need as a state. And that's what we need as a nation. Great. So we're gonna go to Nicole. Uh, Nicole, we uh, see in your uh, bio that you are piloting a middle school enrichment program. Can you talk about what that is and what made you come up with this idea and what are you hoping that you will achieve with it? Yeah, so um, my program currently is in the very beginning stages at Stafford Middle School. Um, and it's really like two parts coming together. So the first part is my district has put together a technology agreement where um, they have really prioritized including technology in all classrooms, um, teaching children about like how to use programs, how to be safe online. They've really integrated that as like a main part of our curriculum. On the other hand um, is the special ed piece. So. Um, like I mentioned before, I, my background is primarily in special education, and I'm really passionate about the fact that both ends of the spectrum need to be serviced. So um, in my own case, I, I was part of a gifted and talented program growing up in school. I took AP courses. However, once I got to college, I realized I need accommodations as well. So um, I really see the two ends of the spectrum overlapping in many areas. And so I wanted to be able to provide that programming to my students who may be the high flyers, may be the students that 
finish early. Um, so far, my students this year have participated in the Connecticut Radon Poster Competition, uh, Connecticut Spelling Bee, Hour of Code, Veterans Day programming, things like that. Um, and I really hope to continue integrating that so that hopefully we can grow our program. Um, as a district, we are currently beginning the official identification procedures of um, kind of identifying those gifted and talented students at the fourth grade level. So hopefully in two years, I'll, I'll have a nice uh, hefty caseload of kids um, and I'll be able to take what I know now as a technology instructor and integrate that into my teaching as an enrichment instructor, so. Great, thank you. So yeah. th this question is for anyone who would like to participate uh, and answer with their ideas. So as we were putting this panel together, we were finding very few teachers of color doing STEM related work in our state. So the, our question to all of you is, what can the state of Connecticut, teacher organizations, and school districts do to incentivize more teachers of color to teach computer science. And by the way, I hope your school districts are right now at the University of Connecticut at the uh, teacher recruitment program because there are, um, I went to a, a job fair at UConn and there was another job fair going on uh, at the same time to try to get UConn students to become teachers. So um, I don't know who would like to take a stab at that question. Please go ahead. All right, I'll get started with that yes, one. Please, please. Um, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, there is a public school teacher shortage around and Connecticut is no different. So if we're looking at our black and our Hispanic population, they only make up about 15% of the teaching pool. And I think the first step that we need to do to get teachers to teach STEM, to get teachers to teach computer science is we're going to have to incentivize um, and we're gonna have to work for our minority teachers, okay? I think we need to approach and recruit as early as possible. I think we need to start like we do for other majors at the high school. We need to let students see what it's like to be a teacher and expose them. But I also want to point out, you know, I believe this is going to continue to be a problem because education traditionally doesn't pay as well as some of the other careers. A computer science major comes out of school making 70 plus thousand dollars and teachers don't make as much money. So if we're asking people to go into the computer sciences and then come back and teach, it's gonna be a lot for the love because they would take a pay salary. So, I mean, it's easy to say, but at the end of the day, if we wanna get good qualified people, we're gonna to have to start prioritizing the fact that teachers are important and we're going to have to pay teachers their worth because the fact is it is us and I love the commercials that are out there now that say, you know, I have my job because of a teacher. And that's exactly what it is. The teachers are creating all of these fields, computer science included. So to make sure that we're getting more people into those fields as a nation in general, we're gonna have to start prioritizing teachers. So I will also say, uh, ladies and few gentlemen who may be listening or watching is that uh, teaching has traditionally been a pink collar job like nursing, mm -hmm. like early childhood education. And unfortunately, uh, teachers have not been paid uh, according to their worth. Um, and in my estimation, as a, somebody who went to public school in Middletown and um, uh, my kids uh, went to the same schools that I did and even had some of the same teachers, um, that um, we don't pay our teachers enough. They literally are uh, helping 
to shape our future with what they do every day. And I would love to see us uh, remunerate teachers, nurses, um, all the people, early childhood uh, educators. I would like to see all of those folks uh, get paid what they're really worth because, um, you know, I, I agree, I couldn't agree with you more that that will be uh, an incentive. Uh, you know, and the governor and I are trying to come up with ways to um, make sure that we've got um, scholarships or incentives for young people to be studying, teaching, but you're so right in the end that that, that alone probably isn't going to do it. So I don't know if we have anybody else who wants to add to that question. I, I can try to chime in. And sure. I know one of the things that is happening in West Hartford is we have this uh, group called Future Educators of Diversity. I can drop the link in the chat here. Um, and that group takes high school students that are excited to become educators and works with them and puts them in situations like student teacher um, relationships or um, mentoring younger students or even sometimes making lesson plans for younger students. I will say that we still do have a major problem where the majority of those teachers do not necessarily want to go into STEM, right? So to give truth to what you're saying, it's absolutely still very much a thing. And then the other um, thing I wanted to share is um, if I think uh, some of this can also depend a bit on how we're teaching STEM. And so if we're teaching STEM in a, in a way that is um, appealing to all people, to more people, um, and specifically computer science in a way that's appealing, so culturally responsive, then perhaps we would attract more teachers to be able to teach it. And so I share the um, Kapoor Center's put together a beautiful resource that's about um, culturally responsive um, approaches to teaching computer science. A lot of what's there could be extended to STEM too. Um, so hopefully that adds, adds something to the conversation. Great, great, wonderful. Well, we're gonna go to Jackie, uh, who uh, is the vice president of the Computer Science Teachers Association of Connecticut. And since resources were just brought up, um, just wanted to see if there's anything aside from what you mentioned that we can do to support computer science teachers. Um, and I don't know if in that role, you've heard about things that are needed or things that are missing that um, you can provide some uh, color on. Yeah, no, I'm happy to I'm happy to speak a little further. So first off, through the Computer Science Teachers Association, one of the things that we really need from our first off, I want to make sure everybody knows that we exist. <laughs> so the Computer Science Teachers Association is um, a group of voluntary teachers that just want to help make life easier for computer science teachers and make make sure that they feel less alone and supported. So that's that's first. <laughs> um, we would love it if more people would become active members because um, the more that people are contributing, the better we can do together. Um, also, I want to call out that Connecticut for a long time has had computer science listed as really an unfunded mandate. When I look around at our neighboring states, like in Rhode Island and in Massachusetts and in, um, you know, you don't have to even, um, Arkansas, there's some Pennsylvania, there's some very Arizona, well-funded states in terms of computer science education where districts can apply to get grants to be able to move computer science forward. Um, PD is provided as part of sort of through the state offices. So um, if it would be it would be amazing if computer science were supported in a financial way. So um, legislation's important. It's a step forward, but um, adding some funding to that legislation to make sure that teachers, to, to your point, Lieutenant Governor, are able to get the training that they need because computer science is this evolving field and we're gonna constantly need training and retraining. Um, and a lot of our teachers are excited to do it, but we uh, frankly just need the support, the financial support to be able to get those trainings and, and the time too. <laughs> um, yeah. Got it, got it. 
All right. Anybody else want to chime in? All right. Well, I do want to say on April 11th, the Governor's Council on Women and Girls will be hearing the voices of our girls at a full council meeting. And one of the presentations will touch on the experiences that girls are having learning STEM and computer science subjects. And in particular, um, some girls are having a desire to learn in same gender working groups as they reach middle school, I see some heads nodding, um, and high school because their team engagement styles are different from boys. So this question is from everyone. And I see we have mainly female uh, panelists here. We do have some, some uh, male, male folks uh, listening. So I was wondering uh, what you think about that and whether that's something that you see. I'll, I'll be curious. Anybody want to weigh in on that? Go ahead. Um, yeah, so I graduated from a historically women's college. So I feel like I, I sort of know a little bit about this. Um, so I graduated from Mount Holyoke and part of my reasoning of choosing that college as a place for me to get my higher education had a lot to do with that. Um, I felt like the environment was a little bit more welcoming. In terms of in the classroom, I do see differences in like, like you said, learning style and group collaboration um, between the two groups. Uh, uh, that's not to say that one group of students is not necessarily having the same um, ways to approach a topic. Uh, but I have definitely found that at least in my classroom, even when I'm doing things like uh, engineering or technology projects, I have seen uh, girls gravitating towards girls um, or female identifying students as well. I'll just say, um, before we go to anyone else who wants to weigh in, that the commissioner of education and I, uh, Charlene Russell Tucker, had the opportunity to uh, visit several high schools where groups of students had uh, competed with various projects that students in the high school voted on. And the, the contest was to win $20,000 for your school to do something to, to come up with a project and get support from the students and whichever project got the most support would get the $20,000 funding. So there were projects to build community gardens, to um, have uh, more sophisticated equipment and computer labs so students could work on art projects and um, other STEM projects. There were, um, mental health rooms or place spaces where students could decompress if they were getting stressed out. And what I found interesting was in these situations where you'd have groups of high school students presenting ideas, we went to several schools, both Bristol and South Windsor. And it was interesting because there were a lot of groups of girls doing presentations. They were very poised. There were just a few uh, males, but I had to chuckle because um, the girls were really quite uh, eloquent about their projects. Some of them were computer science related, uh, some were not. But then I'll contrast that to our computer science uh, computing contests that we do are the Lieutenant Governor's project. We see equal participation all the way up to middle school among boys and girls, and then there's a nosedive. Um, and once you get to middle school and high school, all of a sudden there are way less girls participating. So I don't know if anybody wanted to kind of weigh in on that. 
I have a couple thoughts to kind of echo what Nicole was saying. I do believe that girls, I mean, tend to get gravitate towards other girls when building their groups. And as a classroom teacher, um, I don't have any problem with students choosing their own groups. You know, I, if computer science can be challenging enough and can be discouraging at moments, and we need to build resiliency with our students to problem solve. I don't need their partners to be part of the problem that they feel that they need to solve, right? So I feel that it's important that as they're creating and learning and growing and failing forward, that they are comfortable with who's around them, that they will take those risks. And if I feel like if I force a grouping that that might not um, allow people to take that risk. But with that being said, you know, the environment is in such that, you know, once somebody does something cool in the room, you know, it's like, oh, hey, why don't you check out what she just did? Or why don't you go look at what he just did? Or, um, and it's not always a classroom presentation, but very low key, informal. And then you get these connections between groups of people that normally wouldn't connect um, because they did something cool. And then it's about the project and not about the people. And so they've already are at a point where they're proud of what they did. And so I feel that that's one way that we can get everyone to the table, you know, so to speak, and kind of share everyone's ideas because you are going to have different strengths and weaknesses in any group, right? And as far as the female interest dropping off prior to high school, I mean, I can only speak to high school and those are the sort of things that we wanna to do to encourage. Um, but I do feel, and Jackie, you might be able to speak to this with your um, district position, that the vertical alignment between computer science and understanding um, what computer science is and having the time in the day to be able to adequately um, embed that and integrate that to encourage kids along the way. Um, that that's that's a big question, and it's a big structural shift that we need to um, do. It's a, it's a rather paradigm shift to our districts to accept, and it's exciting to see that West Hartford is taking that charge on, and you know, giving the time, the space, and the funding to allow that vertical alignment. Because unless we have that continuity, you know, K through 12, it's great that there's so many high school programs and trickling down a little bit to the middle school. But if we don't have that solid K through five base where everybody feels welcomed and um, are able to fail forward in a comfortable environment, we're going to continue to see that drop off in that, in my opinion. So I think that collectively um, as a district, this needs to be looked at. And of course, you know, funding always plays a role in that when it comes to time and resources. So I don't know if Jackie, you want to echo in on any of that or... Those are my thoughts. I'll, I'll pause because I know, Stacy, you were going to say something. So I want to make sure that you say something first and then I'll I'll remember what I need to say. <laughs> All right. It's, uh, thank you. The funny part is, is one of the things I wanted to do was speak to students that are currently computer science majors out there, especially at the college level, because we know that their next step obviously is career. So I reached out to my son and I, he shared with me some other information. I specifically wanted to speak to the females and they were very few. And this is a problem. So one of the things I said to her was, I said, well, do you think it should be taught differently? And her response to me was no, computer science is diverse. She says, it does not matter if you're a girl or boy, if you're black or you're white. Computer science is computer science and it's trial and error. So really what the students need is the ability to persevere, the ability to be flexible and continue to try. But I wanna to add to that, she specifically then said to me, well, I don't get computer science like your son does. And I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, it takes me a little bit more time to process and figure things out. And I think we have a lot of students that if it's not easy, they kind of stop. So we really do have to teach a generation of students that it's okay to fail, that trial and error is part of the process and they can persevere. And it's because she knows that concept and that she understands that we all learn differently that she is able to move forward and continue to strive. But again, she's maybe one of three in a class of 50. So being also comfortable to be able to sit there. We all know that we learn better when the people are, when we see people around us. So 
the more that, and I even said to her, I go, okay, you heard what you said. That means you need to go out there when you're done and make sure girls and females see you doing what you do. Go ahead, Jackie. Go ahead, Jackie. Yeah, that, that was beautiful. I, I always feel like I need a little time to process everybody's things because they're saying such beautiful things. I, um, I think about my daughter, she's now 14, but she was uh, five years old when she did a robot camp. And I had, of course, you know, like a good computer science mom. I had talked up computer science. She was so excited. She showed up to this robot camp and she was the only girl. <laughs> and so we had to talk her in to going the next day and she was fine after the next day. She understood what it meant and she understood how to do it and she was fine. But we did have to talk her into it. And I think I worry. Um, so connecting this to your, to your question, um, there is a study that's been repeated again and again across engineering students where they ask female students, how do you think you're understanding what it is you're learning compared to everybody else? And then they ask male students the same. And the female students across the board disproportionately can compared to the males will say, I think other people understand it better than me. The males will say, I think I understand it better than most. And then when you look at but the can grades- I, Can I just say that this but when is- you, When you look at, a, sorry. Oh, I was just gonna say that this is not, um, this is not only, applicable to computer science oh, I know. <laughs> this is applicable to life and right. politics like if you at women have to be asked seven times to run for office before they'll say yes because they'll say to themselves oh I don't know enough. I don't have enough experience. I have to take a class. I have to get another degree. Whereas mm -hmm. men, nobody even has to ask them because they assume that they can do it. And uh, so it's it, it just, um, so you're saying this and it's just applicable to so, so many other parts of life. Right. So, so true. And but now when you so I'm going to end this with a happy ending. When you okay. when you when you ask them, how are you doing compared to other students? It turns out the female students are outperforming the male. And this is not just true in engineering. This is true in computer science. We repeated it in a West Hartford analysis. This is it starts at the high school. And the, so I don't know if the cure to that problem is separating. I, I you know, it's like. I almost, it's a, how does this, if, if by separating a student gets more confidence, good. But if that isn't leading to a student's increased confidence, then that is not an approach that's going to work. And we need to surround our children. Our girls need to get the same experiences, even in our homes as our, as our, as our boys do. Every, we need to make sure that both of our genders, and this is across the state, even in our homes, are having the same experiences to build those confidences so they're ready to take risks when they're in the high school. I think I, think I connected to what you were asking me to say, Kristen. I, yeah. All right, well, uh, that, was, that was great. We're gonna go to our final question and anyone and all of all of our panelists can weigh in. So right now we have a lot of teachers here who are either currently teaching computer science or they're considering teaching computer science in the next school year. So what best practices do you have to share for uh, the successful development of a computer science curriculum um, as they, start thinking about this for their school or their district. Any suggestions that you have, any hurdles they can anticipate and any suggestions you might have for those folks? Anybody like to start I'll, on that one? I'll start us off. Okay. Uh, the first thing I wanna encourage everyone is to, um, Take a deep breath and don't think you need to reinvent the wheel, right? There are so many amazing curriculum providers out there. There's no need to think that you need to start from scratch. 
There are providers out there that are free or of charge. There are all different entry levels um, that will support all sorts of different types of classrooms and different types of learners. So it almost there's so many that it could almost be overwhelming, you know, and so that would be the first thing that I would encourage people to just realize that there is support out there. And as uh, Jackie mentioned, the Computer Science Teachers Association of Connecticut is an am amazing support system as well um, and a great um, networking tool as well. So I think that knowing that there's so much resource out there in terms of online curriculum, as well as professionals that are willing to help you right here in state, um, I think that's going to be very encouraging. And also that there's opportunities for grants as well. You know, I know myself and Nicole, we were recipients of the code.org grant. There's the Perkins funding, and there's different local grants that are available that if there's um, a lack of funding to get started, um, that there might be a little jumpstart money somewhere that you might uh, be aware of. And then finally, um, just there's different PD opportunities as well. I know Sacred Heart or Infosys Pathways Institute. Um, there's a lot of different great PD opportunities that I'm sure somebody here on this panel can follow up with as well. So I'll, I'll close at that. Thank you. Great. Anybody else want to weigh in? Yeah. Um, so in addition to what Kristen said, I think like there are really amazing um, curriculum out there. What I also want to really emphasize is don't skip the basics. Um, I am constantly surprised. Um, I teach digital literacy every day to middle schoolers. Um, and I teach a lot about cybersecurity, cyber safety. And I'm teaching this to a generation of students who you know, grew up with iPads, grew up with phones. They are the most technologically advanced group of children that we've had in the classroom. However, the um, amount of what they know about the device that they are using is really low. Um, I mean, the fact that they, they don't even know that a picture doesn't disappear when you click the delete button um, is something that I deal with on an everyday basis. So I would say while you're looking for those curricula, while you're looking for those resources online, it's really important that you look for something with a solid foundation that really, I mean, obviously there's only so much time in the day, but that really touches on the very foundation of computer science or even like common parts of it. What, what is the device that I use every day at school? How does my Chromebook work? You know, what are the settings? How do I do this? Um, I, I think that's very, very critical as well. I'll add and chime in on that. But I want to speak specifically for the elementary school. Um, you mentioned time. Time is a big aspect here. And we have to consider that in elementary school, the day is completely allotted where there is no time. So I think it, you're coming from an elementary school aspect, you really need to consider the fact that computer science may not be a silo for you. You may actually have to embed it in the curriculum, which means it needs to be interdisciplinary. There needs to be an interdisciplinary approach where you can allow students to, again, solve problems and use coding and use all of these pieces of curriculum that are out there, but embedded in the sciences, embedded in your math, social studies and your reading. And then districts aren't gonna say specifically elementary schools, there's not enough time. It does need to be interdisciplinary to make it work. And one of the things we're talking about in Windsor is not just having a media specialist where it's done as one third of part of what they do, but actually having computer science as one of the specials that students do. Because I agree with you completely, Nicole, they do not know how to use this technology. They know, they know how to go to YouTube and they know how to go on TikTok, but they do not know what those devices can really do. And giving them that time to learn it is going to be major. I know when I was in school, you actually took computer and they said, this is the screen and this is the, and we completely skip that now. And we assume that these kids know these things and they really don't. So we do have to teach it and we need to make sure that it's embedded in everything we do, especially at the elementary school level. Thank you uh, so much for that, uh, those wise words. 
So, uh, Christine, we have a few minutes. Um, if there's any questions for our panel of experts, now would be the moment. I don't know if you have any in the chat or if anyone would like uh, to ask. No, no questions so far. All right. Well, I just want to say thank you to our panelists for uh, being such great resources for our teachers. We really, really appreciate uh, your leadership, ladies. Thank you so much for what you do every day with our students. We appreciate your ideas and uh, we look forward to seeing you all sometime soon. And we hope that we've maybe inspired some future computer science teachers because you all are great role models. So thank you very much for what you do. And that concludes our session. So we'll see everyone next time. Thank you.